If you enjoy what you're hearing, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so we can find each other again in future. And if you want to support the channel further, please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Hello there, my name is John, and I am here to bring you a sleep story. So find some place comfortable, lie back, let your arms and legs fall slack at your sides, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. Tonight, we return to witches, wizards, and little old ladies, as we continue with Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Chapter 7 in which a scarecrow prevents Sophie from leaving the castle. Only a particularly bad attack of aches and pains prevented Sophie from setting out for Market Chipping that evening. But the drizzle in Port Haven had got into her bones. She lay in her cubbyhole and ached and worried about Martha. It might not be so bad, she thought. She only had to tell Martha that the suitor she was not sure about was none other than Wizard Howell. That would scare Martha off. And she would tell Martha that the way to scare Howell off was to announce that she was in love with him, and then perhaps to threaten him with aunts. Sophie was still creaking when she got up next morning. Curse the Witch of the Waste, she muttered to her stick as she got it out, ready to leave. She could hear Howell singing in the bathroom, as if he had never had a tantrum in his life. She tiptoed to the door as fast as she could hobble. Howell, of course, came out of the bathroom before she reached it. Sophie looked at him sourly. He was all spruce and dashing, scented gently with apple blossom. The sunlight from the window dazzled off his gray and scarlet suit and made a faintly pink halo of his hair. I think my hair looks rather good this color, he said. Do you indeed, grumped Sophie. It goes with this suit, said Howell. You have quite a touch with your needle, don't you? You've given the suit more style somehow. Ha, huh, said Sophie. Howell stopped with his hand on the knob above the door. Aches and pains troubling you, he said. Or has something annoyed you? Annoyed, said Sophie. Why should I be annoyed? Someone only filled the castle with rotten aspic and deafened everyone in Port Haven and scared Calcifer to a cinder and broke a few hundred hearts. Why should that annoy me? Howell laughed. I apologize, he said, turning the knob to red down. The king wants to see me today. I shall probably be kicking my heels in the palace until evening. But I can do something for your rheumatism when I get back. Don't forget to tell Michael I left that spell for him on the bench. He smiled sunnily at Sophie and stepped out among the spires of Kingsbury. And you think that makes it all right? Sophie growled as the door shut. But the smile had mollified her. If that smile works on me... Then it's no wonder poor Martha doesn't know her own mind, she muttered. I need another log before you go, Calcifer reminded her. Sophie hobbled to drop another log into the grate. Then she set off to the door again. But here Michael came running downstairs and snatched the remains of a loaf off the bench as he ran to the door. You don't mind, do you? He said in an agitated way. I'll bring a fresh loaf when I come back. I've got something very urgent to see to today, but I'll be back by evening. If the sea captain calls for his wind spell, it's on the end of the bench, clearly labeled. He turned the doorknob green downward and jumped out onto the windy hillside, loaf clutched to his stomach. See you, he shouted as the castle trundled away past him and the door slammed. Botheration, said Sophie. Calcifer, how does a person open the door when there's no one inside the castle? I'll open it for you, or Michael. Howell does it himself, said Calcifer. So no one would be locked out when Sophie left. She was not at all sure she would be coming back, but she did not intend to tell Calcifer. 
she gave Michael time to get well on the way to wherever he was going, and set off for the door again. This time, Calcifer stopped her. If you're going to be away long, he said, you might leave some logs where I can reach them. Can you pick up logs? Sophie asked, intrigued in spite of her impatience. For answer, Calcifer stretched out a blue arm-shaped flame divided into green finger-like flames at the end. It was not very long, nor did it look strong. See, I can almost reach the hearth, he said proudly. Sophie stacked a pile of logs in front of the grate so that Calcifer could at least reach the top one. You're not to burn them until you've got them in the grate, she warned him, and she set off for the door yet again. This time, somebody knocked on it before she got there. It was one of those days, Sophie thought. It must be the sea captain. She put up her hand to turn the knob blue down. No, it's the castle door, Calcifer said. But I'm not sure. Then it was Michael back for some reason, Sophie thought as she opened the door. A turnip face leered at her. She smelled mildew. Against the wide blue sky... A ragged arm ending in the stump of a stick wheeled round and tried to paw at her. It was a scarecrow. It was only made of sticks and rags, but it was alive, and it was trying to come in. Calcifer! Sophie screamed. Make the castle go faster! The stone blocks round the doorway crunched and grated. The green-brown moorland was suddenly rushing past. The scarecrow's stick arm thumped on the door, and then went scraping along the wall of the castle as the castle left it behind. It wheeled its other arm round and seemed to try to clutch at the stonework. It meant to get into the castle if it could. Sophie slammed the door shut. This, she thought, just showed how stupid it was for an eldest child to try and seek her fortune. That was the scarecrow she had propped in the hedge on her way to the castle. She had made jokes to it. Now, as if her jokes had brought it to evil life, it had followed her all the way here and tried to paw at her face. She ran to the window to see if the thing was still trying to get into the castle. Of course, all she could see was a sunny day in Port Haven, with a dozen sails going up a dozen masts beyond the roofs opposite and a cloud of seagulls circling in the blue sky. That's the difficulty of being in several places at once, Sophie said to the human skull on the bench. Then, all at once, she discovered the real drawback to being an old woman. Her heart gave a leap and a little stutter, and then seemed to be trying to bang its way out of her chest. It hurt. She shook all over, and her knees trembled. She rather thought she might be dying. It was all she could do to get to the chair by the hearth. She sat there panting, clutching her chest. Is something the matter? Calcifer asked. Yes, my heart. There was a scarecrow at the door, Sophie gasped. What has a scarecrow to do with your heart? Calcifer asked. It was trying to get in here. It gave me a terrible fright, and my heart. But you wouldn't understand, you silly young demon. Sophie panted. You haven't got a heart. Yes, I have, Calcifer said, as proudly as he had revealed his arm. Down in the glowing part under the logs. And don't call me young. I'm a good million years older than you are. Can I reduce the speed of the castle now? Only if the scarecrow's gone, said Sophie. Has it? I can't tell, said Calcifer. It's not flesh and blood, you see. I told you I couldn't really see outside. Sophie got up and dragged herself to the door again. Feeling ill, she opened it slowly and cautiously. Green steepness, rocks, and purple slopes whirled past, making her feel dizzy. But she took a grip on the doorframe and leaned out to look along the wall to the moorland they were leaving behind. The scarecrow was about fifty yards to the rear. It was hopping from clump to heather clump with a sinister sort of valiance, 
holding its fluttering stick arms at an angle to balance it on the hillside. As Sophie watched, the castle left it further behind. It was slow, but it was still following. She shut the door. It's still there, she said, hopping after us. Go faster. But that upsets all my calculations, Calcifer explained. I was aiming to circle the hills and get back to where Michael left us, in time to pick him up this evening. Then go twice as fast and circle the hills twice. As long as you leave that horrible thing behind, said Sophie. What a fuss, Calcifer grumbled. But he increased the castle speed. Sophie could actually, for the first time, feel it rumbling under her as she sat huddled in her chair, wondering if she was dying. She did not want to die yet, before she had talked to Martha. As the day went on, everything in the castle began to jiggle with its speed. Bottles clinked. The skull clattered on the bench. Sophie could hear things falling off the shelf in the bathroom and splashing into the bath, where Howell's blue and silver suit was still soaking. She began to feel a little better. She dragged herself to the door again and looked out, with her hair flying in the wind. The ground was streaking past underneath. The hills seemed to be spinning slowly as the castle sped across them. The grinding and rumbling nearly deafened her, and smoke was puffing out behind in blasts. But the scarecrow was a tiny black dot on a distant slope by then. Next time she looked, it was out of sight entirely. Good, then I shall stop for the night, said Calcifer. That was quite a strain. The rumbling died away. Things stopped jiggling. Calcifer went to sleep, in the way fires do, sinking among the logs until they were rosy cylinders plated with white ash, with only a hint of blue and green deep underneath. Sophie felt quite spry again by then. She went and fished six packets and a bottle out of the slimy water in the bath. The packets were soaked. She did not dare leave them that way after yesterday. So she laid them on the floor and, very cautiously, sprinkled them with the stuff labeled drying powder. They were dry almost instantly. This was encouraging. Sophie let the water out of the bath and tried the power on Howell's suit. That dried too. It was still stained green and rather smaller than it had been, but it cheered Sophie up to find she could put at least something right. She felt cheerful enough to busy herself getting supper. She bundled everything on the bench into a heap around the skull at the end and began chopping onions. At least your eyes don't water, my friend, she told the skull. Count your blessings. The door sprang open. Sophie nearly cut herself in her fright, thinking it was the scarecrow again. But it was Michael. He burst jubilantly in. He dumped a loaf, a pie, and a pink and white striped box on top of the onions. Then he seized Sophie round her skinny waist and danced her round the room. It's all right! It's all right! He shouted joyfully. Sophie hopped and stumbled to keep out of the way of Michael's boots. Steady! Steady! She gasped, giddily trying to hold the knife where it would not cut either of them. What is all right? Letty loves me! Michael shouted, dancing her almost into the bathroom and then almost into the hearth. She's never even seen Howell. It was all a mistake. He spun them both round in the middle of the room. Will you let me go before this knife cuts one of us? Sophie squawked. And perhaps explain a little. Weep! Michael shouted. He whirled Sophie to the chair and dumped her into it, where she sat gasping. Last night, I wished you dyed his hair blue, he said. I don't mind now. When Howell said Letty had her, I even thought of dyeing him blue myself. You could see the way he talks. I knew he was going to drop this girl just like all the others, as soon as he'd got her to love him. And when I thought it was my Letty, I... Anyway, you know he said there was another fellow, and I thought that was me. So I tore down to market chipping today, and it was all right. 
Hal must be after some other girl with the same name. Letty's never even seen him. Let me get this straight, Sophie said dizzily. We are talking about the Letty Hatter who works in Cesare's pastry shop, are we? Of course we are, Michael said jubilantly. I've loved her ever since she started work there, and I almost couldn't believe it when she said she loved me. She has hundreds of admirers. I wouldn't have been surprised if Hal was one of them. I'm so relieved. I got you a cake from Cesare's to celebrate. Where did I put it? Oh, here it is. He thrust the pink and white box at Sophie. Onion fell off into her lap. How old are you, my child? Sophie asked. Fifteen, last May Day, said Michael. Calcifer sent fireworks up from the castle. Didn't you, Calcifer? Oh, he's asleep. You're probably thinking I'm too young to be engaged. I've still got three years on my apprenticeship to run. And Letty's got even longer. But we promised one another. And we don't mind waiting. Then Michael was about the right age for Martha, Sophie thought. And she knew by now he was a nice, steady lad, with a career as a wizard ahead of him. Bless Martha's heart. When she thought back to that bewildering May Day, she realized that Michael had been one of that shouting group leaning on the counter in front of Martha. But Howell had been outside in Market Square. Are you sure your lady was telling the truth about Howell? She asked anxiously. Positive, said Michael. I know when she's lying. She stops twiddling her thumbs. She does too, said Sophie, chuckling. How do you know? Michael asked in surprise. Because she's my sister... sister's granddaughter, said Sophie. And as a small girl, she was not always terribly truthful. But she's quite young and, uh, well, suppose she changes as she grows. She, uh, may not look quite the same in a year or so. Neither will I, said Michael. And people our age change all the time. It won't worry us. She'll still be Letty, in a manner of speaking, Sophie thought. But suppose she was telling the truth, she went on anxiously. And she just knew Howell under a false name. Don't worry. I thought of that, said Michael. I described Howell. You must admit he's pretty recognizable. And she really hadn't seen him or his wretched guitar. I didn't even have to tell her he doesn't know how to play the thing. She never set eyes on him, and she twiddled her thumbs all the time she said she hadn't. That's a relief, Sophie said, lying stiffly back in her chair. And it certainly was a relief about Martha. But it was not much of a relief because Sophie was positive that the only other Letty Hatter in the district was the real one. If there had been another, someone would have come into the hat shop and gossiped about it. It sounded like strong-minded Letty, not giving in to Howell. What worried Sophie was that Letty had told Howell her real name. She might not be sure about him, but she liked him enough to trust him with an important secret like that. Don't look so anxious, Michael laughed leaning on the back of the chair. Have a look at the cake I brought you. As Sophie started opening the box, it dawned on her that Michael had gone from seeing her as a natural disaster to actually liking her. She was so pleased and grateful that she decided to tell Michael the whole truth about Letty and Martha, and herself too. It was only fair to let him know the sort of family he meant to marry into. The box came open, it was Cesare's most luscious cake, covered in cream and cherries and little curls of chocolate. Oh, said Sophie. The square knob over the door clicked round to red blob down of its own accord, and Howell came in. What a marvelous cake, my favorite kind, he said. Where did you get it? I, uh, I called in at Cesare's, Michael said in a sheepish, self-conscious way. Sophie looked up at Howell. Something was always going to interrupt her when she decided to say she was under a spell. Even a wizard, it seemed. It looks worth the walk, Howell said, inspecting the cake. I've heard Cesare's is better than any of the cake shops in Kingsbury. Stupid of me to have never been in the place. And is that a pie I see on the bench? He went over to look. 
pie in a bed of raw onions, human skull looking put upon. He picked up the skull and knocked an onion ring out of its eye socket. I see Sophie has been busy again. Couldn't you have restrained her, my friend? The skull yattered its teeth at him. Howell looked startled and put it down rather hastily. Is something the matter? Michael asked. He seemed to know the signs. There is, said Howell. I shall have to find someone to blacken my name to the king. Was there something wrong with the wagon spell? said Michael. No, it worked perfectly. That's the trouble, Howell said, restlessly twiddling an onion ring on one finger. The king's trying to pin me down to do something else now. Calcifer, if we're not very careful, he's going to appoint me royal magician. Calcifer did not answer. Howell roved back to the fireside and realized Calcifer was asleep. Wake him up, Michael, he said. I need to consult him. Michael threw two logs on Calcifer and called him. Nothing happened, apart from a thin spire of smoke. Calcifer! Howell shouted. That did no good either. Howell gave Michael a mystified look and picked up the poker, which was something Sophie had never seen him do before. Sorry, Calcifer, he said, jabbing under the unburned logs. Wake up! One thick black cloud of smoke rolled up and stopped. Go away, Calcifer grunted. I'm tired. At this, Howell looked thoroughly alarmed. What's wrong with him? I've never known him like this before. I think it was the scarecrow, Sophie said. Howell swiveled round on his knees and leveled his glass marble eyes at her. What have you done now? He went on staring while Sophie explained. A scarecrow, he said. Calcifer agreed to speed up the castle because of a scarecrow? Dear Sophie, do please tell me how you bully a fire demon into being that obliging. I'd dearly love to know. I didn't bully him, said Sophie. It gave me a turn, and he was sorry for me. It gave her a turn, and Calcifer was sorry for her, Hal repeated. My good Sophie, Calcifer is never sorry for anyone. Anyway, I hope you enjoy raw onions and cold pie for your supper, because you've almost put Calcifer out. There's the cake, Michael said, trying to make peace. The food did seem to improve Howell's temper, although he kept casting anxious looks at the unburning logs in the hearth all the time they were eating. The pie was good cold, and the onions were quite tasty when Sophie had soaked them in vinegar. The cake was superb. While they were eating it, Michael risked asking Howell what the king had wanted. Nothing definite yet, Howell said gloomily, but he was sounding me out about his brother, quite ominously. Apparently they had a good old argument before Prince Justin stormed off, and people are talking. The king obviously wanted me to volunteer to look for his brother, and like a fool I went and said I didn't think Wizard Suleiman was dead and that made matters worse. Why do you want to slither out of looking for the prince? Sophie demanded. Don't you think you can find him? Rude as well as a bully, aren't you? Howell said. He had still not forgiven her about Calcifer. I want to get out of it because I know I can find him, if you must know. Justin was great buddies with Suleiman, and the argument was because he told the king he was going to look for him. He didn't think the king should have sent Suleiman to the waste in the first place. Now, even you must know there is a certain lady in the waste who is very bad news. She promised to fry me alive last year, and she sent a curse out after me that I've only avoided so far because I had the sense to give her a false name. Sophie was almost awed. You mean you jilted the witch of the waste? Howell cut himself another lump of cake looking sad and honorable. That is not the way to put it. I admit I thought I was fond of her for a time. She is, in some ways, a very sad lady, very unloved. Every man in Ingery is scared stiff of her. You ought to know how that feels, Sophie dear. Sophie's mouth opened in utter indignation. Michael said quickly, Do you think we should move the castle? That's why you invented it, wasn't it? 
That depends on Calcifer. Howell looked over his shoulder at the barely smoking logs again. I must say, if I think of the king and the witch both after me, I get a craving for planting the castle on a nice, frowning rock a thousand miles away. Michael obviously wished he had not spoken. Sophie could see he was thinking that a thousand miles was a terribly long way from Martha. But what happens to your Letty Hatter, she said to Howell, if you up and move? I expect that will be all over by then, Howell said absently. But if I could only think of a way to get the king off my back. I know. He lifted his fork with a melting hunk of cream and cake on it and pointed it at Sophie. You can blacken my name to the king. You can pretend to be my old mother and plead for your blue-eyed boy. He gave Sophie the smile which had no doubt charmed the Witch of the Waste and possibly Letty too, firing it along the fork, across the cream, straight into Sophie's eyes dazzlingly. If you can bully Calcifer, the king should give you no trouble at all. Sophie stared through the dazzle and said nothing. This, she thought, was where she slithered out. She was leaving. It was too bad about Calcifer's contract. She had had enough of Howl. First green slime, then glaring at her for something Calcifer had done quite freely. And now this. Tomorrow, she would slip off to upper folding and tell Letty all about it. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this sleep story, feel free to leave a like and a comment. If you would like to support the channel further, you could subscribe to my Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to hear more sleep stories like this, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. I upload a new story each and every week. Thank you again for listening, and pleasant dreams. Good night.